All right, welcome to the first lecture for the online version of English 3300, uh, Theoretical Approaches to Literature. We are in this course using the textbook right here, um, Literary Theory and Introduction by Mr. Terry Eagleton. Um, and for this beginning lecture, we're going to go over the question, what is theory exactly? What is literary theory? How do we uh, apply it? What is the purpose of its existence, if you will? As well as look at his preface to the anniversary edition um, of the book we are reading for class. So the first question I think probably most of you have, or if you don't, you soon will have, is what is theory, a theory in general, or what is literary theory in particular? And theory is, well, it's, it's a difficult concept to get. A, a theory, right, is an explanation for a field or subject of inquiry outside of which nothing shall fall. So it provides a totalizing explanation of a field of inquiry, a subject, right? For example, you have like the theory, theory of gravity, the theory of relativity, right? These theories within the realm of what they are trying to describe account for any scenario which could occur in the natural world, right? So it's the same thing for a theoretical approach to politics or economics, like for example, the very famous a Marxist theory, right? Marxist theory purports to provide an explanation for the totality of experience in the political and socioeconomic realm using one set and one structure of explana explanatory guidelines, right? Uh, history, says Marx, is the history of class struggle, right? The whole conflict that arises either within a society and its classes, um, its elite versus its working class versus its poor, and also between nations, right, and the geopolitical uh, global sphere, it's a result of economic competition and economic inequality. And so because everything is rooted in this economic, this material um, lack on the part of some and the material excess on the part of others, the conflict this creates between classes explains political strife, war, famine, starvation, in uh, inequity, unhappiness, um, turmoil, right? Because it sees material goods and the provision of them is the primary motivating force behind human action. So because you have this basic principle, right, that material goods are what define um, the motivation for human action, then you have a theory when through which all of the events that play out historically, socially, culturally, economically, geopolitically, right, are all explainable through the rubric or through the... the um, the, the, the perspective of socioeconomic or economic material access or lack, right? And so this is a theoretical explanation because it can use these kind of theoretical criteria to explain any situation. It provides the same answer to any question and tries to explain away any scenario, rather, um, using the same set of principles. So literary theory, um, there are, again, a, a myriad of different literary theories Right, or theories that are applied to reading literature, and they all try to do essentially the same steps as I just explained Marxism doing for a number of cultural and political um, arenas. Right, it is you have a set of theoretical principles which you are taking and using to explain or to account for certain things in the literary text you're reading with it. Right, and so what you have is oftentimes, and this is I think what I would call theory at its worst, or like the theory grinder machine, is okay, we're going to do a feminist reading of, oh, Frankenstein, right? And so here's Frankenstein right here, right? And here's feminism as a theory. And so feminism provides a certain number of answers and accounts for explaining what goes on in the world. And so you have a set of principles, you're then putting the text and shoving it through and turning the crank, and out the end pops a feminist reading of Frankenstein, which looks like you highlight and emphasize a certain number of elements that feminism presupposes to be indicative of its theoretical paradigm in the text of Frankenstein, and then you find those and put them together, right? And you get, ta-da, the bits of Frankenstein that lend itself very nicely to a feminist reading of the text, right? And because of this, you have oftentimes a, a narrowing of the perspective or of the possible experience of the text or narrowing of the scope of human experience that it can speak to. 
And so this is the danger, I think, of some theoretical approaches, right? Is instead of having a, a work of literature which is talking about broadening out our understanding of the human experience, broadening out our notion of what it means to be a, a living individual who has emotions, who has you know thoughts, who wants to express their innermost um, parts of their being to other human beings and be understood fully, right? And, and, and to have a notion of what life was for humans like us in different cultures, in different ages, a thousand years ago, um, in Mediterranean world, wherever, right? It, and to only look for a certain number of predetermined elements in any text uh, to perform a kind of reading that per fulfills a theoretical agenda seems to cut off what potentially one could get from reading a text without that paradigm imposed on it. So this means that like, if you have you know, a, a, a non-theoretical or a non-agenda-driven theoretical paradigm, right? that the, the, any text would be more open to the, the whole possibility of human um, emotion, of, uh, of explaining and, and giving you access to parts of the human experience and human understanding that you may not have encountered before in your life in you know, the 21st century um, in America, right? Um, and to only care about or, or key in on certain elements of a text um, to fulfill an existing paradigm seems like it might be decreasing the value of the potential benefit of the text as opposed to enhancing it. Um, so that's a warning, I guess, about using some of the theoretical paradigms in the way I just described. So in, in, in Eagleton's preface to the anniversary edition of the book, right, he talks about how it's been 25 years since the book came out. And this is an older edition, too, so it's been like 35 years now since the book came out originally, right? And literary theory has morphed in, in that point in, from that point in time till now. Well, originally it was kind of this avant-garde, subversive, like counterculture, French continental Europe kind of thing where there'd be one theory teacher on campus and he would wear like, you know, a, a black spandex unitard and, and everybody in the class would be wearing berets and smoking cigarettes and drinking vodka in class, right? And there'd be 10 of them. And they'd all be like, you know, doing Marxist theory and talking about how corrupt the academic institution is and the money and the trustees and all this stuff, right? And, and all the orthodox literature professors would be like, who are these guys? They're rebels. We don't even know if they're like actual literature students. So it was like edgy and, you know, everybody was all about it. Um, you had to be committed because you'd be ostracized from the rest of the English department if you were the theory person, right? And that's kind of not happens that way. It doesn't happen that way anymore. Like theories become mainstream. Um, for major and minor requirements for literature degrees, as well as most humanities degrees, you have to do at least one theory course of some kind, sometimes or often two, as an undergraduate, as a graduate student, many more than that. Um, and so you kind of have what Eagleton worries is a mainstreaming of this edgy, cool, theoretical, uh, you know, train or school of thought, right, that he thinks is kind of being diluted now by me making it a requirement for uh, for undergraduate degrees. And so he, he says, well, what theory does when it's doing well, when it's not merely just a required course, right? It has what he calls peer theory, which is it poses questions about all the other pursuits in the world, about all the other ways that we read literature. Like, what is literature? What is a text? What is the canon? What is a character? What is a narrative? And theory like asks all those tough questions that people who are looking at character and narrative and, and, and canon, they don't even bother to ask. They just assume those are things. And okay, that's, that's cool, right? Like, you can ask, why is the canon, meaning all the collection of books we think are important to read as, as Western uh, literature students, right? Like, why is that what we read? And that's an important question to ask. What about Chaucer or Shakespeare or T.S. Eliot or um, James Baldwin makes them essential to the tradition of literature? And the answer might be there's nothing essential about any one of the authors that makes them necessary for the canon. They could exist without them, right? Uh, the question really is, like, do the works that we read in literature classes, especially undergraduate literature classes, um, represent the kind of broad range of human experience across time and space, across culture and race, that gives us depth and breadth to our understanding of the potential for communicating deep emotional, philosophic, intellectual, human ideas that we don't encounter 
on the everyday, right? The intensity of experience in Hamlet is something that's not usually observed uh, at, at a sports bar on a Friday night, right? And so it, it's a way that we access the depth of our humanity as well as understand the, the uniqueness of our own place and time. Uh, at the same time, we recognize the similarity of our emotional states and our personal thoughts and beings to all of humanity across time. Right, and so to say, like, well, you want to look at character analysis. Well, what even is a character, right? That's what Eagleton wants theory to say, and you can do this with anything. Well, well what is a novel? How do you even know it's a novel? Like, well, well, what's the difference between a long short story and a short novel? Um, you can ask these questions, and that's that's fine, right? The qu the problem is when you don't posit an answer to them, you get to a point of what's called infinite regress, which is what's a character? Well, a character is like you know and and fictional individual who has an identity well what's an identity and well identity is the thing the author what's an author really i mean so you have a deconstructionist critiquing theoretical viewpoint which tries to get to an unanswerable first question right and while it is useful to take a step back and think about well what do we mean when we say a character like what does that actually mean what do we mean when we say theory what do we mean by a novel what do we expect from a novel these are good questions to pursue them doggedly to the point where it's a um, where it's no longer getting anything productive for a study of literature and is merely becoming kind of a a, a a wormhole of whys, whys, looking for a primary cause that's not there, um, can get non-helpful very quickly, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, at the bottom of page, Roman numeral 8, Euclidean says, um, like, theory can deal with whether or not, or theory, sorry, rather, rather, literature critics will say whether or not Oscar Wilde was a major or minor writer, but theorists prefer to investigate the norms and criteria by which we make such judgments. Reading involves interpretation, but hermeneutics inquires into what goes on when we interpret. A critic may speak of literary characters unconscious, but a, theory, a theorist is more likely to ask what a character is, and whether or not stories can have their own consciousnesses, too. What happened in the past couple decades is that what one might risk calling pure or high theory is no longer so much in fashion. They don't talk of semiotics, hermeneutics, post-structuralism, and phenomenology as they did in the 70s and the 80s. Even psychoan psychoanalysis is a theoretical approach is now out of vogue. Now it's mostly deconstructionism, post-colonialism, and some sort of de, um, de-escalated feminism is what Eagleton says. And why are these kind of theoretical approaches and movements now much more in vogue than the abstract high theories of the 70s and 80s is because there's an element of the pragmatic, an element of the especially political in these newer post-structuralist, post-colonialist theories, which put themselves in opposition to the power structures that exist and define themselves largely through the negating of, uh, other, uh, of certain social groups through the attempt to rise up or raise up and, and propagate the the work and the theory and the thought of other disenfranchised historically social groups, right? And so we see that as the the theories of political movements which deal with identity aspects, which deal with cultural aspects, which deal with ethnic aspects or racial aspects, right, are on the rise. The theoretical concern in literature also mirrors that. Why? Well, because we're all members of the polis, of the political society, of the world as a whole, right? And politics, especially in the information age, especially in the contemporary society in the West we live in, right, is inescapable from an individual point of view. And so it's only natural for those kind of political movements which rely upon identity and rely upon our interiority and our experience and our feelings in order to have their traction in the outside political world, right, require we take those same kind of perspectives into what we consume as individuals, into the texts we read, into the works we view as literature, right? And so Eagleton says this is a natural outgrowth of the theoretical movement, but it's much less interested in the theoretical questions and more interested in power questions, in what can we do with this? Like, what can we do with this text to help the movement? What can we do with finding authors who represent this identity group to help the movement politically, to forward ideas socially, to have an agenda which is not literary in nature, but is political or social or cultural in nature that the literature text is then subordinate to and put into action for? Right? And so it's a different use of literature and a different use of theory to accomplish a non-theoretical, non-literary, very practical, real end. Um, and that's 
kind of just the way it's gone, he says, right? And, he, and he's okay with that. He's like, well, at least people are still studying theory to some extent, and that's good for him, right? Um, so the last thing he ends with here is that... Uh, mm, so there was a lot of, of, of humming and hawing about theory when it first came on the, uh, the scene in the English department because people thought, well, this is not like reading this is not reading literary text this is reading some you know b-list kmart style sociology or psychology or philosophy and applying a very watered down version of it to find some kind of rubric to interpret literary texts through and this eagleton dismisses as less as people who are jealous because we have theory and they they didn't like it they were just like you know traditional orthodox um old fuddy duddies who weren't down with the sickness who ah and so I think that to some extent, the resistance to it is traditionalism or a, 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 ver a version of the traditionalism. I think also there's some merit to their, or to the critique he, a, even straw man's right here. And, and that is that in order to properly apply a lot of the theoretical paradigms that literary theorists, post-structuralists, post-colonial theorists, Marxist theorists, um, feminist theorists, uh, critical race theorists employ in the reading of literary text, right, are largely, if not entirely, borrowed from social scientific disciplines, psychology, sociology especially, political science to some extent, some historiography, right, and, and that the theorists who make the, the mark by coining or creating the seminal text in a literary theory uh, that becomes the basis for interpreting a thousand other texts and a thousand graduate theses is about using this theory to read a text, right? Is that they don't have an expert understanding themselves of the sociological theory or paradigm or the psychoanalytic um, practicum that someone who's an expert in those disciplines does have. So you have um, somebody applying a sociological theory to become a literary theory and they're misusing or misinterpreting or, or taking a very rudimentary and reductive notion of that theory uh, from a sociological or sociologist's point of view and applying it to a literary text because it's convenient and easy and edgy because no one's done that before, right? Um, for example, um, we'll, a theorist will read later in the semester, Kathy Carruth, uh, founded what's known as trauma studies or trauma theory in literature now. And her understanding of trauma is very interesting from a, a amateurist perspective as far as a literary critic, as far as a, a clinical psychologist or a trauma treatment specialist uh, is concerned or a neurobiologist. But it's really a parroted, dumbed down, oversimplified version of actual studies that have been done about trauma and the brain and how the parasympathetic nervous system responds to memory implantation, et cetera, et cetera. And so her, her knowledge of the field in which she's taking the theoretical basis from to apply it to literature is not sufficient enough to convince anyone who's actually a master in that field of neurobiology or trauma or parasympathetic nervous response to traumatic events, right, sufficiently that she even knows what she's talking about, about the field that this knowledge became revel or came from is being imported into literature as a theoretical paradigm, right? And so there's a a risk of that too. So I want us to all read with open eyes and think about the ways that these things that are not literary in origin are being imported and used to describe literature or used to read literature in a certain set of ways, right? And to ask whether or not maybe the theorist who implements them even knows fully what they're talking about on the theoretical basis. Um, so yeah, so that's there's the intro to what theory is and what we're going to look for in the class. Um, I will see you next time for What is Literature? The Introduction to the Book. Thank you.